But want to welcome everybody in tonight. Uh, we're doing our first deep dive of 2022 with our dear friend, Misty Irons. So we are going to give um, a few minutes to let everybody else kind of jump in, uh, see who all is going to show up for the live version. And then we've got a lot of people I know that have said that they can't make it tonight that will be watching later um, on the YouTube channel. But um, feel free as we are talking tonight to use the chat um, to talk amongst yourselves, react to things that are going on, or if you want to go ahead and start putting questions in the chat so that we can see those when we get to the Q&A time, that would be excellent. Misty, how are you doing tonight? Well, admittedly a little nervous because I've never done this before, but um, yeah, hopefully when we get talking, I'll warm up to it. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> I understand that I, um, I still get a little nervous and I've gotten to the point now that I do like one or two of these a week between podcasts and, and zoom meetings like this and webinars. And I'm still nervous. I think sometimes it's a little bit, it's kind of healthy. I'm not really sure that how I would feel if I quit being nervous about it. So help, helps me to keep things in check. I think that's true. Let the spirit flow. Right. So exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just enough to, to keep me humble and to keep my filter on. So it's probably a good thing. So tell us a little bit, um, well, I'm gonna give an outline uh, tonight, just kind of an overview quickly of what we are gonna be talking about while we are on here. And then I'm gonna give you a chance to introduce yourself um, for those who um, may not necessarily know who you are. So let me... Um, give everybody just a quick overview of what we're going to be doing. So first thing after we chat and Misty tells us a little bit about herself and how she got involved um, in the LGBT community, we're going to talk specifically about Misty's um, talk this past October at Revoice 21 that um, was absolutely phenomenal, had some of the um, best feedback that we've gotten so far of any talk that we've done at Revoice of how helpful and encouraging it was, how challenging it was to consider um, the book of Galatians and the idea of legalism. So we're going to talk about that talk specifically. That's going to be the specific deep dive part is things that she may want to add or um, give us a little more context to that talk specifically. And then we are going to talk a little bit about um, other ideas that go along with legalism, taking a look at what are some ways that um, as people, regardless of where we're coming from, that we might add additional boundaries around the gospel. When we talk about setting boundaries around the boundaries, uh, what are some ways that we can help guard ourselves against this temptation of legalism? And then we're going to wrap up um, looking at some of the critiques and criticisms that were noted um, that actually were specific criticisms. I told Misty earlier today that at this point, most of our critics just say, ah, heretics, and don't even bother engaging with, with what's going on with the content. Um, but we had a couple of people who specifically um, did engage with some of the context and offered some uh, criticism and a little bit of pushback. So we're going to talk about those um, a little bit, but just a little bit. Uh, because we want to make sure that we save enough time for questions that y'all might have um, for us about the subjects that we cover tonight. So we're going to be looking through those things and uh, giving an opportunity just to, to share and to talk and to hear from one of our favorite allies. So hope that y'all have your seatbelts on because it's going to be a fun, fun evening. So uh, looking forward to it. Looking forward to hearing Misty a little bit about uh, your additional thoughts and maybe some of the background behind the talk that you gave in October. Um, but let's start, first of all, with you just telling us a little bit about yourself. Where are you? Who are you? How did you get involved in um, being such an incredible uh, sibling and ally for the Simon community specifically? Oh, uh, well, um... Like Becca said, my name is Misty Irons, and um, I've been a straight ally to the LGBTQ community since uh, 2000, so it's been over 20 years. 
And um, it actually all started not because I had a family member or not because I had uh, a friend or anything like that. I actually had neighbors that I was trying to, to witness to. And um, in the process of trying to evangelize to them, I, um, I failed and um, I didn't uh, really connect with them at all. Um, I developed sort of a, a, a real liking to, to my neighbors. They were um, a gay couple that lived next door, a couple of guys named Grant and John. And um, over the course of a couple of years, just to kind of like, you know, fast forward it to uh, when I started to realize that God was calling me to this, um, it was the sort of thing where I was a little bit ashamed that I was evangelizing to these guys because nobody I knew evangelized to people who are gay especially the year of like the late nineties. Right. So, um, I, I told my church, um, at the time I was the pastor's wife. So I shared at the church prayer meeting that, um, you know, guys, I'm, I'm like witnessing to homosexual. Um, and, uh, I want you guys to pray for me. And I could tell from the look on people's faces that they weren't going to pray for me. They just thought that was a little bit weird, you know, um, went home that night, got up the next morning and discovered that, uh, that Grant had died of AIDS. And um, that was just this huge, huge wake up call, especially when I saw that um, his partner was treated by Grant's family, just sort of like with total disregard, it was, it became clear to me that his partner must have been taking care of him. His family came that very day that I found out the news and cleared all of his stuff out of the apartment and just left John with like a completely empty apartment, just like, like vultures. They just like, they just wanted the stuff and they just came and left within like maybe four hours. And um, I was shocked and cause I was living just literally like, you know, my door was probably like 15 feet from their door. Oh. And so I saw the whole thing through my window. And um, after, you know, I talked with John a little bit, he moved out. It, it occurred to me, I was, I was uh, putting it together that the night that I was asking for prayer for witnessing to Grant and John was probably the night that Grant actually died. And I wasn't even aware that he had AIDS. I didn't know that he was sick at all. Um, and so it was just this big rebuke to me. I felt it because it was like God was saying, well, what a great evangelist you are because you didn't even know he was sick, you know, like aren't you supposed to know people and love people and, and kind of like speak to their lives, you know, well, he was sick and, and, you know, very sick and you didn't even know it. Um, and I just sort of realized, wait, like, um, I better do some reading on this. So, um, you know, at the time there was just, um, all these books from Christian publishers about, you know, the usual things about homosexuality, you know, it's, it's like, um, you know, you don't want to be gay because you'll die of AIDS and, and this kind of thing. Uh, very condemning, very um, two-dimensional. But fortunately, I didn't turn to the Christian publications because I had a very specific problem on my hands. Like I, I couldn't connect with Grant. I didn't know what his life was. So I went to the non-Christian bookstores and I looked up, you know, stories or testimonies, or if you want to call it testimonies, coming out stories. And the very first one I read told me that these people do not choose to be gay because at the time, 20 years ago, that's what everybody said. Oh, you choose. It's a lifestyle. Essentially. It's like people are naturally straight, but they choose to be gay. They somehow like pervert themselves. They go against nature. You know, that's where they rebel against God. And that's what this is. And I could see from the very start that that's not what this was. And so um, after I kind of got over being freaked out and, um, feeling very like, how is it that everybody from radio preachers to the churches that I all go to, to every godly person that I ever respected, they're all on the same page about how this is a choice except me. Um, so I just thought, you know, I, I think I need to, uh, evangelize in a different way. And the way I need to evangelize is I need to connect with people on a deeper level. And I need to, as much as I can side with their side with them, you know, and just say, I, I believe you, you know, I believe your story. I believe what you say about yourself. And, um, I started a website 
And that website attracted a lot of readers. And one of the, one of the first readers I, I made friends with, very, I was very good friends with this person, was um, a side B person. And he didn't, there was no such thing as side B. Like, I didn't know the term. He didn't know the term. Um, we were just, I just knew that this guy, his name was Buddy. He was living celibate and he was this fiery Southern Baptist, like, oh, I'm a sinner saved by grace, you know, and yes. he'd be preaching to me <laughs> through the email, you know, I could almost just hear him, even though I've never met him. And he was just like, I, you know, he lived, you know, single celibate and everything got kicked out of his house because his brother outed him. Wow. And I just really thought this is, um, this is a man who believes in Jesus. This is a gospel believing, you know, transformed uh, Christian brother. And, and I just thought this is really exciting. Like, look at what he's doing. He was kind of forging his own path. And, you know, he was sort of not knowing that there was other people, there would be other people out there like him, but, um, and then before I got to meet him, he died of a heart attack. Mm. So I never actually got to meet him, but um, I just remember him so well. And, you know, he was my first real friend who was gay and Christian. And I just felt like, you know, God was God. I knew that God was in the whole thing. Yeah. It was really all about following, following his calling. Yeah. That's um, <laughs> I think about that time, 2000, 2002, uh, yeah, there, I think that we were just all individual people assuming that we were the only person in the world who was attempting to figure out sexuality and still trying to love Jesus. Because I mean, at that point, it was still, the narrative was still, you either choose to be gay and leave the church and go follow your sin till its natural conclusion, whatever that means, or you just repressed it and pretended like it wasn't an issue and just stayed in the church, um, that those were your only two options. And so that idea of you can be both was more than I could even like that thought never even entered my mind it 20 years ago. Like that just, that simply wasn't even an option. So to hear stories of people who were doing that and trying to put words to it and trying to communicate it to other people um, is just phenomenal to me. So I, I love hearing Buddy's story. Um, mm -hmm. he, he's I a, loved him. I loved him so much. He's a, he's a <laughs> My big regret is I never got to meet him. Yeah. Yeah. In heaven, in heaven. That's right. One of these days we get to spend all of eternity meeting all the people that we wish we'd gotten to meet. So mm -hmm. that in encouragement of one day the, the pilgrimage will be over. Um, yeah. So that's, thank you so much for sharing that and just being such an encouragement. Um, I think if there's one thing that would be a takeaway for straight allies, it, it's that very simple, but incredibly profound statement you made of to evangelize, we have to first connect and that you connected by just saying, I believe you. Um, that is, it, it can be revolutionizing, um, in somebody's life or to somebody's life that to have someone say, no, 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 you're wrong. You really have chosen this. Even if you don't realize it, your sin has chosen it for you or some explanation that a lot of us heard over the years, but to just have someone in the church who you also know loves Jesus say, I believe what you're telling me, um, would just has a profound impact on how you see yourself, how you see Jesus, um, how you can see the church. So thank you for, for taking that stand and really being courageous in a time that very few people in the church, uh, were doing that. And I know that over the years, um, it's cost you. So thank you, uh, for being willing to, to do that. Um, Moving on a little bit, because um, that really is a good segue into what your talk was about at Revoice 21, is looking at the church and how the church um, approaches the idea of same-sex attraction and the LGBT community in general, how we continue to be talked about as an issue to be corrected as opposed to people to be loved, to steal a title from, from Preston. Um, 
tell us a little bit about um, your talk. Just kind of give us a summary for those who may not have listened to it. Um, and if you can share a little bit of the background of like how the Lord led you to that specific talk for Revoice 21. In the talk, I, I, um, I start out by talking about a story of me sitting in the pew in my church, my very conservative church in the 1980s, and hearing Romans 1 being preached from the pulpit and homosexuals, quote unquote, condemned uh, for their promiscuous lifestyle and how AIDS was the judgment of God um, against uh, this lifestyle because, you know, these people have... Um, rebelled against God. And so God has given them over. And then I talk about how 30 years later, if you were to put me in a time machine, fast forward me to say a revoice conference, um, how could a conference of professing gay Christians who desire to follow Jesus, who desire to live celibate or live in mixed orientation marriages, how could this not be seen as an answer to the prayers that we prayed back in the eighties uh, maybe like not completely believing those prayers, but sort of maybe piously lifting up prayers like, God, please save these very depraved people from their lifestyle. Um, if you were to fast forward from the 80s to 2018 and to the Revoice Conference, how could this not be the answer? How could this not be, yes, you know, God answered our prayers. Hallelujah. This is what we wanted. And instead, why these voices of condemnation? Why is Revoice just being, you know, raked over the coals continually by the conservative church? And so to me, that really, that, that question of why the disconnect is really kind of what set me off, you know, on this, on this journey that I take you through in the talk. And basically, um, the conservative church was concerned about sexual sin, right? And saw that you know sexual sin was was not being it was was being like as they called it punished by God and and so um, the solution should be that well we want people to put off sexual sin we want people to live chaste and holy lives but then when the ex gay movement came along it was really a matter of kind of the agenda kind of switched to well you know if gay people can become straight then you know, that would also, you know, solve a lot of problems, the problems that the church thought were, you know, right. well, then we could, we can deal with these people now if we can just set them straight, you know, pun intended. And um, so with the failure of, of Exodus, with the failure of reparative therapy, the failure of a 40 year experiment, it kind of lands us in this place of basically, what does the church want? Is it concerned about sexual sin? or is it concerned about gay identity? And I think that, you know, as I, in the talk, as I move towards, you know, like confronting this fact that a lot of people in the conservative church will try to redefine the word gay to me, not about sexual orientation, not about attraction, but about a lifestyle. You know, if you're gay, you're, you're saying that you, you still live this lifestyle. It's kind of like wanting to say that, oh, we're still concerned about sexual sin when really you're concerned about identity. Right. You know, why else this insistence on changing the definition of the word gay in spite of the fact that everyone who is gay doesn't use the term that way. Right. And so kind of the underpinnings of my talk is suggesting that, you know, we have our own agenda, but God's agenda continues to be about sin you know, just like it originally should have been. It is it is about sin. And Revoice is a response to the, con the church's concern about sexual sin. And so why isn't Revoice received? And so um, beyond the, the problem with redefining the word gay is just the also the argument that, well, you know, even if um, there are people who are living celibate lifestyles and they're still calling themselves gay. And the word gay is associated with a sinful culture. And so there's this sort of like, there's a constant moving of the goalposts, you know, is it about sexual sin or is it about identity change or is it about, you know, using this word gay? And so I'm just kind of following the goalposts as, as the church continually switches and moves and, and kind of, you know, runs along this path. And I'm just kind of running along with it and saying, 
okay, let's talk about um, the, the word gay. Let's talk about the fact that it's associated with a culture, a secular culture that celebrates, you know, their sexuality in an unbiblical way. And that just kind of led me naturally to looking at the Bible and saying, well, look here, we have uh, the Gentiles. <laughs> we have um, the same situation in the New Testament where we had a people who are not, not really an ethnic people. Um, Gentiles are made of, you know, Egyptians and Syrians and, you know, people from, you know, all sorts of people, right? Not, so Gentiles is, is really not simply an ethnic group, but it's more about being a non-Jew. Right. It's more about the fact that the Jews are people who are under the law and the Gentiles are the people who are without the law. And so this is a very, this is very much from a Jewish perspective to the Jews, the Gentiles um, traditionally were, they had to go through an identity change in order to be a part of their community, uh, whether they were called, um, you know, proselytes, they're circumcised. Sometimes they're just called God fearers. They weren't circumcised, but they were, you know, reverent towards the God of Israel. But um, to the Jews, you had to become uh, circumcised and join their community and identify with Judaism in some way in order for you to, to be accepted. And the gospel just changed all that. When Jesus came, everything changed. Mm -hmm. And so I was creating this, um, I was noticing this parallel between um, how the Gentiles no longer need to be Judaized through circumcision. And likewise, why are we insisting that gay Christians become straight through reparative therapy? And the more I looked into it, I just thought this is, um, this is a very interesting parallel. Yeah. This is, um, it's about, um, it's about two different identities within the church where one group is, is not saying that they're absolutely righteous, but they're saying that they're more righteous. You mm -hmm. know, they're, they're sort of boasting in, um, an identity that is that they feel is more righteous because of you know something that they could something that is done in their flesh you know in circumcision's case it's literally in the flesh but in the case of um straights and gays in the church it's a very similar thing where it's it's a more privileged identity is trying to exclude the other one and the basis is another form of human boasting and as the apostle paul says boasting is excluded so um, so my talk was basically about sort of kind of tracing, um, sort of the, the sort of shifting agendas of the conservative church. I'm suggesting that maybe we've kind of fallen astray into our own agenda and we've really strayed from God's agenda and his agenda is the gospel, mm -hmm. which is that in the gospel, there really shouldn't be these barriers and there shouldn't be these distinctions. And especially when you're, you're boasting in your own righteousness. And we see a lot of that when it comes to, you know, sexual minorities being excluded from the church community. Yeah, that's true. I've also have often wondered, like after listening in October and just being so blown away by that parallel. And it's one of the things I love about the word being living and active is that you can study it and you can teach it and the Holy spirit is still going to reveal different things to different people at different times. And sometimes different things to the same person at different times. But, um, I was thinking as I was listening that, you know, I, I used to teach Pauline epistles and had taught through Galatians nearly a dozen times. And that, that thought had never even once occurred to me. Um, and so I have spent really the last few months just continuing to ponder and to think about, um, that idea of those parallels and what ways we try to add to other groups or to other people in that idea of, of othering and also of, um, I think, especially, I mean, just for myself, wanting to somehow have a leg up on other people. Like that's, um, Paul really got on to the Jews about it in Romans as well of saying, you're no better than the Gentiles. The Gentiles are no better than you. Like we are all sinners at the mercy of a God who wants to save us and wants to be in relationship with us. And I've wondered um, how much of it is just a lack of interest or desire in really talking about our own sin struggles simply because 
if side B Christians are so open about this is the struggle that I experience, it it might raise the bar as far as talking about vulnerability and about sin struggles for the church at large. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've thought about that so much being involved in um, a lot of abuse advocacy. In addition to working with Revoice, that's one of the other things that I've been involved in for years. Um, and looking at how the church as an institution, not individual churches, not individual people, but we just see the habit in American evangelicalism of covering up sexual sin of any sort for the sake of the gospel, um, how much that environment, that culture um, may have a relation to the idea of, well, we just don't want to know about your sin struggle. Like, just keep it to yourself. Don't tell anybody. Don't talk about the problems that you're having. Just pretend like you're like everybody else so that we don't have to think about it. Um, do you think that it, it it could possibly be part of a pushback of transparency about sin struggles or, or am I trying too hard to try mm-hmm. to find a reason for why? <laughs> I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of those kinds of um, otherings, you know, going on in the church. I mean, I think about you know, divorce people, for instance, you know, I mean, or like, you know, families that are, are broken and in some way, um, I, I think that, I think that the overall challenge is that what it's exposing about us is that we don't really believe the gospel. Yeah. And I, it kind of disturbs me, like when you were, when you were sort of quoting, like the, the words that you hear people saying, like, well, for the sake of the gospel, we need to cover up this. What gospel is that? I, I what gospel is that? Um, you know, like in, in Christ, I mean, he, he fulfilled the law, you know, he, he cleanses from our, our sins. He, he is, you know, the lamb, you know, he is our resurrection, you know, he is our righteousness. I mean, like what, what, what is there in your life that, that could possibly separate you from the love of God in Christ? There's what, what is there? There's nothing. And for, for us to be you know, within the the community of faith, for us to be making these distinctions based on people having problems or struggles, um, whether it's circumstances or whether it's, you know, just a fallen nature, um, it's it's absurd to think that we are going to not talk about those things for the sake of the gospel. That is what gospel is that? I don't, I don't really know what what gospel that is. Yeah. That that's often what I want to tell people is like, your, your weaknesses, your sin struggles, your tremendous, horrific failures. If you truly believe what you say in the instance of covering up abuse, what a lot of them preach about the gospel, then you should be able to take that weakness, that sin struggle, that whatever, and say, this is what's going on. And I believe that the gospel has the power to overcome that instead of attempting to cover it up for the sake of a ministry or for when people say the gospel, it really is just a euphemism for a human being's ministry. Um, Because if we were worried about the gospel, we wouldn't attempt to cover up sin. We would take it to people and say, help me with this for the sake of the gospel, not hide it for the sake of the gospel. And I would say that I don't know of any other way to relate to Christ except through weakness and suffering. Right. How else do you relate to the savior? He is the one who bore our diseases and our infirmities. He is the one who is our sympathetic high priest. He was tempted in every respect yet without sin. He Mm -hmm. was, he was persecuted. He was called an illegitimate child. He was, you know, sexually assaulted. He was um, hated. I mean, he, there was, when you confront your own weakness and when you are sitting in the darkness and you call to him, he is right there next to you. And you, and you realize that, that he draws the closest to the brokenhearted. Like the Psalm says, you know, like the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, he is weakness and brokenness and struggle with sin and failure is to me what connects you to Christ. I don't know of any other Christ. I don't know of a Christ who is on a power trip. I don't know of a Christ who, who is impenetrably strong and, 
you know, a hundred percent successful. I, I don't, I don't know who that Christ is. I, the only Christ I know is the one who's bleeding and broken on the cross. Amen. And so for us to like, you know, put people down for, and, and make people feel ashamed of their weakness. That's, I don't, I don't know what that is. That's not, that's not the way of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful way of saying it. And a good reminder that, that all togetherness, um, uh, the appearance of perfection, the, the, it's all a false gospel, um, that anyone who thinks that they need to act like they have it all together for the sake of Jesus, um, I would be so bold as to say they don't really know Jesus, um, not in a way of questioning someone's salvation, but in just saying they don't know their savior if they think that they need to act like they have it all together in order to represent him. Um, because not a single person in the history of humanity who has ever represented Jesus had it all together. And we have a plethora of examples just in scripture of proving the fact that God uses the weak and the humble to confound the wise. I mean, he doesn't use the expected people, the strong people, the put together people. In fact, the strong and the expected and the assumed and the privileged and the put together are the ones that, um, that are just spectacular failures to people's expectations. I mean, you think of, I mean, King Saul, you know, he was the one that everyone assumed would be King, right? He he's the favorite example of someone who looked like they had it all together and, and didn't get it done. But at the same time, the people that God picked were the least likely and were broken, miserable failures, just the same, but they were aware of it. <laughs> for the most part and allowed repentance Me to too. Make changes in their lives. Right. So it, it, it's a huge, it's a huge thing to think about um, and to understand that God doesn't expect us to be perfect and put together and in charge. He expects us to, to just recognize our need for him and, and rely on him. Um, have a good question. And for the most part, I'm going to save questions to the end, but this is one that would be good to clarify here. She said that um, Jesus was sexually assaulted, but I didn't grow up hearing that. Can you explain real quick what you mean by the fact that Sorry Jesus to, was actually sexually assaulted? Sorry to zoom forward to that and yeah, it would be shocking and everything. It's I guess it's something I've right. been thinking about because, you know, for a while I was meditating on the sufferings of Christ and, you know, like I've noticed that like there were, I think it was three times in his sufferings when he was the cl his clothes were torn from him. And, um, you know, when the Roman soldiers, um, what was it called? A legion or, or what was it? cohort? I can't remember the term, but there were, there were, when he was um, being brutalized by the Roman soldiers, there were 600 soldiers present when they were beating him with a rod and tearing off his clothes. And I suspect that some of that might've, might've been sexual assault nature, you know, type of type of confrontation. Um, and I know that there's some assault victims. I'm, I'm sorry if this is a sensitive topic for anybody. I don't, you know, please mute me if this is hard for you, but I know that of some people who have been ministered to by the thought that Jesus can relate to, you know, being vulnerable in that way. Um, so yeah, I just, um, I guess that it kind of occurred to me because I, I kind of always thought like, how, how do victims who suffer in that way relate to Christ? And as I was, you know, thinking about that one day, I, I remember, you know, kind of meditating on his sufferings and that there were a lot of, there are a lot of aspects where it just seems to me like the gospel maybe hints that, that he, he can relate to, to victims who have suffered in that way. So yeah, yeah just um, that idea of being exposed and vulnerable, having your clothes removed. And I mean, I've, I have two brothers and have heard stories and have seen and heard with my own eyes, how guys can pick on each other and make comments about all sorts of rude and vile sexual things. Um, just teasing their best friends. Can you imagine how a group of armed soldiers would respond to a man that they had stripped naked and were brutally beating. I can't imagine 
um, the type of things that he was exposed to or names he was called or things that were done. Um, but yeah, that it's a relatively new thought for me as well, just in the last couple of years of that idea of just being stripped naked and hung exposed for the entire viewing audience to see is an incredibly violating experience. And I think in our sanitized versions of, of Easter pageants and, and things like that, um, we don't always think about the brutality of, of that experience. So, um, that does, that does make a lot of sense. So thank you for, for explaining that, um, for those that that idea would be new to, um, so looking at, at where we were with your talk, with the conversation specifically um, about language, can you um, share a little bit of the thoughts surrounding the issue with language, how it is that um, specifically this idea of language can be used to split and divide. Some just critics in general of side B theology um, say that we're being divisive because we're insisting that people who are same sex attracted should be allowed to call themselves gay if that's how they want to identify that, that it's that insistence that's causing division in the church. But really your argument in your talk that I think you've very um, successfully argued um, is that really it's those in the church who are insisting upon people identifying themselves in a specific way in order to be acceptable within the church is really where the division is coming from. Um, could you talk a little more specifically about that language issue, um, just for those who may not be quite so familiar with, with what that conversation may be about, just kind of briefly explain where that issue comes from and the fact that, like you just said, that's really not ultimately the issue, but give us just a little bit more of a background about the language debates that have been taking place recently. Gosh, I mean, I'm not even sure I'm the best person to, I mean, I'm aware that, you know, um, you know, like in the past, there have been people who are, you know, they would only accept the word homosexual to talk about, you know, this, and then uh, gay became sort of like, you know, the more mainstream word. And then um, people who are more comfortable with ex-gay ministries and that paradigm wanted people to say same-sex attracted. And, and so um, to say gay is sort of like, you know, implies that you're rejecting the possibility of change and, and these sort of things, or, or you're making it more central to your identity and these sort of things. Um, I guess you know, my, my take on it is that um, I just think it's, it's, a, it's pretty unfair to tell people that identifying as gay is the divisive um, stance to take because nobody would have to identify as gay or even call themselves gay, same-sex attracted, homosexual, whatever term you prefer. No one would even have to call themselves that label if it weren't for straight people sort of forcing it. If it wasn't for straight society saying othering you, you know, saying that you are, you are other and that we are going to make an issue of, of accepting you into our families or into our church or at one time, even the workplace or the military. Right. Mm. So it didn't, the, the division didn't originate with people who are sexual minorities. The division originated with those people who are in the majority who are othering and excluding them. And so if you're, if you're gay, what are you supposed to do if you are um, not out to everybody? Let's say not out to everybody, but to some people. And you know that if somebody doesn't know that you're gay, you can never actually understand whether they really know you, love you, and accept you for who you, who you are, if you're safe. And so you have to call yourself something in order to signal that you are that other person, quote unquote. And to find out if, if this is okay, if, if you know, you're a safe person for me to, to be 100% myself to. And how is that divisive? Yeah. The, the origin of this whole problem started with those people who excluded you. By, by calling yourself the label, um, you, are, you are simply trying to 
deal with a situation that is otherwise impossible to deal with. Right. You can't, if you lie about yourself, then you will never know if you are safe. But if you tell the truth about yourself, then you're divisive. I just think that's, that's unfair. Yeah. And I don't think that it's honest about where, where this whole language problem, quote unquote problem actually comes from. Right. It would be a whole lot easier. Um, we, we joke in our community about wanting to come out just so like the little ladies at church will quit trying to set the guys up with their, you know, their granddaughters or, you know, people will stop asking, you know, once you're past the age of 22, when you're going to get married. Um, if we could just with comfort say, you know, well, I'm, I'm gay or I'm bisexual or I'm this, or I think God's called me to singleness um, or any range of explanations and know that we aren't going to immediately be reported to the elders and thrown out of church because we say that, well, I'm not really looking for a partner of the opposite sex, you know, or being able to just say, you know, the same cop outline for always of, God just hasn't brought the right person into my life yet when we may feel deep down that he's not ever. And that applies to straight singles as well. You know, I mean, maybe you're just not called to be married. It's not something that God's asked you to discern. Um, if, if we could just be more open about those types of conversations without thinking that we're going to be judged or we're going to be disciplined, um, it wouldn't really have to be a conversation. I think you're right that um, often um, those of us that work in this, um, ministry world on a regular basis, um, it's nice when we get to talk about something that's not sexuality. Uh, I talked to someone the other day, um, about doing a, a workshop about, um, returning to church after losing your faith, kind of on the, the deconstruction, uh, line of thinking. And the first thing that they said was, thank you so much for not asking me to talk about X, Y, and Z that had to do with gender and sexuality. Like I very rarely get to get asked to talk about anything other than those issues. It's like, yes, like that is, that is what we are working towards as a community is reminding people that we are holistic image bearers and not just our sexuality, which we are often um, accused of being the ones that want to focus and want to make that our primary identity and repeatedly having to say, no, we to a person would much rather talk about 1500 other things before we talk about our sexuality, but we are so hypersexualized even within the church that people think that that's the primary perspective that they should have of us. Um, and that is so incredibly, um, just horrible, um, that and think about all the people who are, here we are making an issue of their sexuality constantly, right. Instead of, you know, just realizing that, you know, in Christ, you know, they are justified, sanctified, glorified, you know, I mean, we're, we're essentially, you know, we're, we're a heavenly community already here on earth in Christ. Mm -hmm. And we are missing out on the spiritual gifts and contributions of all these sexual minority Christians because we're we're not allowing them to to be a part of the body. You know, it's like right. you know, what First Corinthians says what Ephesians four says that you know we're a body. Everybody needs to contribute, and and that contributes to the health of the body. Our body is unhealthy because we're not we're not including people who are legit brothers and sisters in Christ. You know. In, into the body because we're just making a, this we're flattening people in this one dimensional issue right. and not allowing us to, to benefit from, from their gifts. Yeah. Yeah. And that really is the aim and the goal. And that's what I appreciate about, about your talk um, this past year was looking at those parallels um, with the church in Galatia, what you end up seeing um, through Paul's later writings and just through the church in general, as it's gone through history, is the fact that Gentiles were not continued to be othered, that they were welcomed as full members who were able to lead and to be elders and to pastor churches and to be entrusted with these incredible stories. And that, you know, I mean, Luke 
got to write a gospel and the book of Acts, right? Like you hear, so, oh, look, a Gentile got to contribute to the scriptures, right? How and divisive of them. I know it's incredible that, you know, people that were questioned about being really Christian because they weren't circumcised end up being these incredible leaders in the early church. Um, and that really is the, the hope and the prayer that the church today is moving towards realizing that the gay same-sex attracted people in their churches who want desperately to hold to those conservative biblical traditions um, for lack of a better terminology here in evangelical America, um, that that they have full giftings and abilities and perspectives and, and views of church life, views of scripture that can contribute powerfully to the wholeness and the health of the church. So thank you for continuing to, to share that in new ways as the Holy Spirit points things out to you and you're just boldness and in, in sharing those things with us. Um, will always be, always be appreciated. Um, by Shout out to Art Herrera for his revoice talk on that, where he that's right out so nicely. <laughs> that's right, yay Art! Um, so glad he works with us all the time now. It makes sense. <laughs> um, last thing about this past um talk, and then we're going to talk a little bit about those critics because not everyone was excited about your talk as I was. Um, we'll get to that in just a second. Are there any things looking back um, that you wish that you would have added to the talk or that you've thought since then of, oh, this would have been a really good thing to add that you might want to share with us now? Um, nothing, nothing, you know, to add to the talk itself because I had to really condense things down. It's kind of, you have to cut everything out, but I have continued to think about it. And something that um, I was thinking about recently um, it was actually prompted by, uh, if I may give uh, Greg Johnson sort of, uh, you know, reading his awesome book, Still Time to Care, uh, which is a, a terrific book I recommend to everybody. He said something interesting, which is that the idea of finding your identity in Christ is actually kind of a recent thing. And it's not, it's, it's like the concept is somewhat biblical, but it's not like 100%, you know, in the Bible. And I was thinking about that. Um, not that, you know, it's, it can't be used to, to edify and it's not an edifying idea, but that language is not actually in the Bible. And I was thinking that wouldn't it be a little bit more helpful to think about our identity in terms of Christ's identity, that Christ's identity is really central and that our identity is in relationship to his. So, you know, if Jesus is the shepherd, we're the sheep, you know, um, you know, he, he is, he is the friend of sinners, right? And so our identity is we are the sinners and friends of Christ, you know, that's why we're hey. you know, gay Christian. <laughs> and, um, but a very powerful idea is that Jesus is the bridegroom. Mm. And so we are the bride and, and that idea that Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride, we are married to him already. I mean, isn't, isn't the whole idea and the whole debate about sexuality is like, well, you know, you need to become straight so that you can enter into the proper kind of marriage, you know, which is a marriage between a man and a woman so that you can enjoy God's gift of marriage. But, you know, like another thing that Greg Johnson points out in the book is that, you know, one day we're all going to be living celibate. Right. For like well, all of eternity. <laughs> right. Because, and on the, the flip side is that is that we're all going to be married to Jesus. Right. And so, in a sense, like, why are we wasting time, like talking about like, well, how come your sexual orientation didn't convert to the right orientation so that you can enter into the marriage when the earthly marriage, the human marriage, which is, you know, great, it's blessed. It's, it's a wonderful thing, but it's training wheels, right? You know, it's training wheels for the, the real marriage, which is with Christ. And like Greg was pointing out in the book, which, you know, was that um, by, by living celibate, gay Christians have kind of bypassed, you know, the training wheels. He didn't use the word training right. wheels, I'm using that word, <laughs> kind of bypass the training wheels and just went straight to the heavenly ethic, just which is to be in thing. marriage union with Christ. Yeah. So, you know, like, I, I think that, you know, since Christ is the bridegroom and, and we're the bride, I mean, those who are living celibate, 
are have already graduated to to doing that to to engaging in that relationship and so i mean you know not i'm not saying that you know human marriage between a man and a woman is not valuable or blessed or or wonderful but mm -hmm. it's a shadow right and the right. substance is is christ the ships the substance is really it's pointing to your marriage in christ and so those people who are you know um living living in celibacy and in marriage to christ are really entering into that that very glorious union and, and into the reality of that so um yeah i just think that it's a little bit more healthy to think about christ's identity and how our identity is really in response to his identity and another thing that i, you know, I was thinking about was you know i was reading through acts and i was noticing that the moment of the aha moment for the jewish christians was that when the Gentiles um, believed and they received the Holy Spirit, so they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in those days, you know, when it was all new, they, they spoke in tongues as the sign, you know? Right. And I was thinking, yeah, you know, I mean, when you call yourself a gay Christian, what you're really talking about is you're talking about Jesus. You're talking about his relationship to you. You're not like labeling yourself. You're not saying something about this is who I am. And this is me defining myself. You're saying something about Jesus, just like when Jesus sent his Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles, they were Gentile Christians because he sent his spirit upon them as Gentiles. And so with with my gay Christian friends, I just think, you know, it's not like Jesus is up there in heaven saying, OK, well, you know, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit once you become straight. And so, like, you know, I'm just kind of waiting around for that. And then once you become straight, then I'll send my spirit to you. You know, no, he 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 has already baptized you with this Holy spirit as someone who's gay, as someone who's lesbian, as someone, you know, who's a sexual minority. That's why you are a gay Christian because Jesus came to you while you were gay. And so I, I just think that, you know, to be, to call yourself a gay Christian, I'm not saying that it's, it's a label that's fit for everybody. Not everyone's comfortable with that. I'm yeah, that's fine. But for those people who, who want to label that to me, it's just a, it's just a confession of, of Jesus coming to you and not saying you have to become straight in order for me to, to be in union with you in order to me, to, for me to take you as my bride. Yeah. That's beautiful. I appreciate that. Um, I have a, um, an article that I read recently that actually did a massive word study and converted it into data um, about the the increased usage of the I, the phrase identity in Christ or talking about people's identity in the Christ. And I was shocked to learn how incredibly recent that phrase is in like all of, of Christian writing that um, it, it's really only been in the last 35 to 40 years that anyone has used that, that terminology um, in 2000 years of church writing. So mm -hmm when we have this new idea, um, we get condemned an awful lot, um, for using new words and new terminology, um, or redefining things, but that's exactly what's taken place. Um, <laughs> even within the church with this idea of identity in Christ. And, um, I'll see, I'll have to dig the, the article back up, but I'll be sure to include it in the notes on YouTube for anybody that wants to, to check that out because there are graphs and, links and all sorts of fun stuff for people who like to nerd out on data like I do. Um, but that really the more traditionally proper terminology goes back to good, solid refor reformed theology and that idea of union with Christ, that we are with Christ and in Christ, not that we just find our identity in him, but that we are a part of him because he has taken on our being and we have taken on his and that incredible exchange um that transcends just how you identify yourself mm -hmm. um that really that's that's a lesser conversation than the fact that we are unified and one with christ but also unified and one with one another so if we are demanding something of people that we aren't demanding of ourselves that is what creates the division when we are supposed to be unified with one another because of our mutual relationship with Christ. So it's, a, it's a fascinating subject that I could talk about for a long time because mm -hmm. I love talking about stuff like that, but we will move on because we have other things to talk about. Um, 
so quickly looking at um, a little bit of those who were detractors, um, a couple of specific pushback points um, is one that is just the classic that we've talked about with the issue of language of just don't identify yourself with your sin, that you can be a Christian who struggles with ongoing same-sex attraction as if that's an easy thing to say or to explain, Um, but that you can talk about the fact that it's an ongoing issue, that God didn't make you straight, that you can do all of these things except use the word gay. And so some of the pushback for your talk was simply that it seemed that you were giving a pass to people who want to identify with their sin. Um, Do you have any specific response to those types of comments, especially from like the ex-gay crowd, that their specific critique is, we don't talk about it unless it's a specific purpose or reason, because we are no longer condemned. We are no longer, you know, such were some of you to hang tightly to second Corinthians. Um, what, what is your response to those who continue to have that argument of you just don't need to use the word gay because you're tying yourself too closely to your sinful desires? It's, it's tricky when people talk that way because, you know, sometimes they're defining the word gay in a way that's, you know, implying, you know, lifestyle or practice or something like that. So that's, that's the first problem. Right. Um, You know, and, and then when you sort of like talk about, well, let's, let's define the word gay accurately. Let's talk about it as being not like, you know, your lifestyle or a practice or an action or, you know, active sex life or something like that, but, you know, orientation and, you know, attractions, those sort of things, um, you know, as side B people, we acknowledge that's part of the fallen nature, you know, to have those same sex attractions. And then once you start defining it like that, like you just think, well, who, who has escaped that? You know, who, who is, you know, like how, how could you, how could you not talk about yourself in those terms? And, and the problem that I have when it comes to giving examples is that no one example exactly parallel, parallels what it, it means to, to have same sex attractions. You know, you could talk about like people use the term like, or people use the example of alcoholism or something like that. The problem with that is that there's a limited analogy to that, but um, a good analogy or using that in, in a good way is to say that you wouldn't, you wouldn't condemn somebody who's Christian who says that they struggle with alcoholism, right. you know, um, you know, autism is, is another bad analogy because it, you know, it's a, it's maybe, you know, like a condition, but it doesn't have a moral aspect to it, right. but you would never like condemn somebody for saying oh, you know, my child is autistic or I have, you know, I'm on the spectrum or something like that. But once again, okay. when I use these analogies, they're not really analogies. They're just like partial, you know, parallels to, to what we're talking about. But I, my point is that I just feel that there's really a, a disingenuousness to me sometimes when people say, well, why are you identifying with your sin? Yeah. Um, because what sin is that? And Oh, we're talking about something with the fall. Well, you know, why not? Um, And if we are talking about sin, I mean, we're talking about like Paul who said, I am the chief of sinners, you know, and Jesus is being the friend of sinners and, um, you know, Matthew being called and he's the tax gatherer, you know, and, you know, I mean, there's, there's language in the gospels that use, um, that refer to people's sinfulness, um, maybe former lifestyles or, or maybe continual struggles to glorify the gospel, to say that there is, there is no one who is excluded from the call to repent and believe, you know, and like, what would we do if we thought, well, you know, not me because I am such and such a, you know, I'm this category of sinner or that category of sinner. I just, I just find it a little bit odd that we'd be so concerned about this one area and everyone else gets a pass. So it's hard for me to, to know how to address that. I mean, I, I would, I would want people to explain a consistency, you know? Um, And if there isn't a consistency, I have to ask myself, well, what are you really saying? 
are you are you are you just saying that people should be back in the closet yeah you know i mean that's ultimately that's, that's really what a lot of them so would prefer you know I, I mean it's it's hard to to bring that up because it's not something that a lot of people would admit but when i sum up you know all the the accusations and the remarks and the criticisms and everything sometimes it just it sums up to me it sounds like well they just want people to be back in the closet verbally yeah verbally back in the closet yeah i i've had people say as much before like pressing that so explain to me but but why do you feel that way and doing like that just questioning until you really can kind of get to the root of it that um i've had a couple of people over the years that have said i just really don't understand why you feel like you need to talk about it and that that kind of gets to the heart of it of you know, it, it makes people uncomfortable to talk about or to think about those things or to be confronted with the fact that they have this preconceived notion of what it means to be gay and they don't want, they can't deal with that being challenged. Um, and that can relate to a whole host of issues, whether it's race or sexuality or gender or even socioeconomic situations. Um, any sort of situation that we are confronted with people who are different than us and also the preconceived notions and biases that we may have towards those people. Um, it's just human nature to not like to have those things confronted. And it, and so being able to look at that and to say, you know, I've made these assumptions about people who say that they're gay um, and I was wrong. Um, that takes a lot of humility and it's just not often something that you're going to see as a group of people. Um, but the encouraging thing for me, especially is to see those people who become allies, um, through stories like you shared at the beginning of our deep dive. Um, the fact that it was an individual one-on-one -on -one thing for you, that it wasn't somebody coming to your church and, delivering some sermon or being confronted at an event where someone's protesting and you were like, gosh, you know, you are right. Um, it, it was just the Holy spirit in an individual situation and you realizing and working through. And those are the types of one-on-one -on -one stories, um, that we get to really see how the Holy spirit works in relationships because, we have a God who is a God of, of community and of relationship. And that is how he works um, in us and how he works through us. So being able to see um, just how relationship changes those things and how it changes our perspectives on one another uh, is just, it's fascinating and encouraging. Uh, yeah, one of the other thing is that the a better thing to ask instead of you know, a straight person always asking, well, why are you, why do you call yourself gay? And just kind of pressing and pressing on it. Wouldn't it be a little bit more productive to turn the question around and say, what is it that makes you uncomfortable with that? You know, yeah. in, in a safe space, you know, in a, in a safe, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of thing that would, yeah. I would like to see more conversations where it's kind of turn back. I'm like, well, what, what makes you uncomfortable with that? Yeah. I would, I would love to see that. I'd, I'd like to be a part of some of those those conversations. That's a, a long shot dream, I hope, but that's one of those with, with people that are all claiming to be siblings in Christ, or we don't claim to be siblings. We all claim to be followers of Jesus. That means we're siblings and we should be able to talk about those things. I would love to sit down with, with some opponents um, in a way that would allow us to see one another um, humanized as opposed to demonized as being on the same team, if we all say that we're followers of Christ and really be able to, to talk about those things, um, in an open and transparent way in good faith, um, I have to keep, keep praying about that when I have a feeling, but it's a good goal to work towards. Um, so the other, um, much more specific, um, and extensive pushback, um, has been in the form of a podcast and an article uh, from an organization called the Christian Research Institute. And um, 
they did a their own deep dive into Revoice 21 um, and ended up focusing most extensively on your talk, Misty, um, which I, I thought looking at it um, was an interesting place to kind of land, but um, they released a two hour podcast discussing the conference as a whole, and then an 8,000 word essay that looked at and examined a lot of not only your talk at Revoice 21, but also some previous work that you had done. Um, And most of it was one focused on terminology, but also um, some general kind of culture war pushback um, about things like overgeneralization of like you saying the church does these things or how as a community side B people talk about how the church has done this to gay people. Um, Do you have any thoughts or responses to what is becoming a pretty consistent critique of when oppressed groups, um, othered groups talk about the church or white evangelicals or straight people, um, the initial pushback can be, well, not all straight people or not all churches or not all fill in the blank. Um, do you have any response to, to that type of general pushback and critique when minorities express their experiences um, in the church? Well, I mean, you know, I, I took some liberty to, to talk about these things because I am straight, you know, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, first of all, I felt like I, I kind of know what I'm talking about as somebody who's straight and somebody who not didn't, didn't used to be supportive of, you know, sexual minorities in the church. And I was also addressing my talk to a straight audience. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, I addressed the talk uh, to a straight audience in the, you know, of Christians, knowing that I am at a, a revoice, you know, conference with a lot of sexual minority Christians who are sort of looking on. So I, I did take a little bit more liberties in, in speaking about, you know, straight um, people and, and churches and, and some of the things that gay people have to deal with, because um, that's sort of like, you know, my, my role when I am, you know, building bridges, you know, like if you're, if you're gay, how can you talk about it? You know, it's, you're, you're sort of on the defensive and you, you, you have to, you know, a lot of people feel like they have to be in a con- any given conversation of the church where you're just the one gay person trying to like, you know, fit in and educate people and everything. You have to be sort of the good gay, you know, you have to kind of <laughs> keep your mouth shut. You can't sort of say things that, you know, as plainly as you want to, because, you know, people just think, well, you're just acting out of self-interest, you know, yeah. you're, you're biased towards yourself and your own group. So that's why, you know, when it comes to me talking at Revoice as a straight ally, I'm going to be a little bit more, more forthright, you know, about some of these things, because, you know, I'm, I'm talking about myself too. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that. Um, I also, you know, I read the, the article that was published in CRI. I didn't listen to the podcast. Um, I didn't, I didn't read like the entire article because it was, it was a little bit difficult to follow, but um, I'll just say that, you know, I think that the article critiqued the wrong talk because mm-hmm. my revoice talk wasn't actually critiqued as far as I could tell. My mm-hmm. argument wasn't really dealt with. My argument was that, you know, there's, you know, just as the, the Judaizers wanted to exclude gentle identity from the church, you know, and, and require circumcision. So we are trying to exclude, you know, the gay identity from the church by requiring reparative therapy that argument wasn't actually dealt with in the article. Um, So I'm still kind of waiting on, on, you know, what the, what the pushback to my argument is. Right. Um, What the article did deal with though, is another talk that I gave at another audience at another conference in another year. (laughs) Um, So the, the article article mainly focused on that talk and critique that talk. Um, just a, just a brief word on that talk that I gave at GCN in 2016 is that uh, GCN it was a conference um, where both side A and side B people um, would gather. And at, at the time that it was, it was uh, that I was speaking there, it was a largely side A audience, like maybe about 70% in my estimation. 
And I was a side B speaker. Now, as a side B person, I have what's called an accommodationist view of side A, which means that by definition, I don't agree with side A. That's why the need for the accommodationist view. That's why the need for, let me you know, extend the olive branch and let's talk about love. Let's talk about where we do see eye to eye. So that's what the talk was basically about. Now, it's really easy to take an accommodationist talk and turn it into something that it's not, namely, oh, you agree with these people. Well, of course, it, you know, of course, I'm going to emphasize ag agreement because that's the nature of accommodationism, you know, right. but it doesn't mean that I do agree. And so I, I feel that the, the CRI article, you know, badly misrepresented my views because it misread an accommodationist view as an affirming view. So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's problematic. And I think it's also problematic that my, the argument of my actual revoice talk wasn't, wasn't really dealt with in substance. Yeah, I agree. And I would love to see um, good faith opponents, um, good faith concerned siblings in Christ um, engage with, with the work that Revoice in general does, with the talks that you give, um, with, with any of it. Um, I joked a little bit at the beginning that, that a lot of opponents have just, things have been whittled down to a ah, bunch of heretics and is just discounted. Um, and that doesn't do anyone any good. It doesn't do their followers good because they don't know specifically what the problem, supposed problem is with Revoice. They just go, ah, oh, and throw the whole thing out. And it doesn't help us. Um, for those who say that we're so far erring um, away from the gospel and away from biblical teaching, if you truly were concerned about us as siblings in Christ, give us specific things that we need to look at, that we need to consider, that we need to pray through. Um, and that happens so rarely. Um, that, I mean, I have people that I've considered really good friends in the past that have drifted away um, since I started working at Revoice. And they just say, well, you know, you're working with Revoice now. As if that, like that in and of itself should explain why they can no longer be in relationship with me. Um, but very rarely get specific feedback of here are the concerns. Here is, here's what makes my spirit uneasy when I read these things or when I've seen these videos. Um, that it would be my encouragement to, um, to vo both side B advocates to revoice supporters, as well as to those who are opponents is in the love of Christ, recognizing that our battle is not against flesh and blood, um, to be able to have those conversations with one another of this is what concerns me about what you're saying. This is, um, from both directions. Um, that is, that's my prayer is that we will be able to, to continue doing that. Um, I think that there's also something I've been thinking about recently is, you know, in the, in the history of the conservative church, the recent history, um, there has been a lot of um, really misrepresentation of, of people who are gay. Yeah. First it was, it's a choice. And then it was, oh, they can change. You know, and now it's, you know, well, you know, if you call yourself gay, then you're like not identifying, you know, and it's always, you know, the shifting goalposts, like I'm saying, but I mean, just from coming from a perspective of, you know, people who, who have um, badly, you know, misjudged this community, yeah. you could imagine also that and the existence of a, a organization like Revoice is really a difficult thing for people because it really flies in the face of everything that people once thought about, about those who are gay. And, and when, when people were thinking it's a choice and people can change, there was a lot of sin that was, that was committed. You know, there was a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, rejection that was unjust and a lot of hurting of people. And when you consider how much sin that the church has committed, like with this misunderstanding of, of who gay people are and to see people at Revoice where it's like people who are still gay, you know, they're not going to become straight and they're living sexually pure lives, or at least they're trying, you know, or at least they have that desire, you know, it's clearly yeah. 
by grace, that's kind of a rebuke, you know, and it, and it kind of brings up a lot of, you know, not only have we been wrong, but we've wronged people. Yeah. And there may be a, a huge portion of the church is not really ready to reconcile with that, you know, within themselves. So I, I, my recent thought has been maybe the blowback against revoice has just been, um, just been like people not being able to, to, um, to deal with that, yeah. you know? So that's where I pray that we have the same grace to extend towards people that we, we hope that they'll extend towards us. Um, got some good questions here. First one is, um, Misty, do you have one tip for pastors or churches um, to bring greater hospitality to great to gay Christians? One tip. Um, <laughs> man. I mean, you know, whoever you are, you're on this talk. So, you know, you're <laughs> educating yourself and. I just think, um, I think that relationships are just so important. Um, I, I, um, is, did, did this person say they're a pastor or uh, just a member of the church or just a member? Yeah. You know, like, um, I've been a part of some very conservative churches where, um, you can't really do sort of the standard thing, like watch this video and let's discuss it. And, yeah. you know, like, um, let's set up a panel, you yeah. know, and, <laughs> and that could, that's just not gonna, not gonna work, you know, right. this church is very conservative. Um, I, I have, I have often just, um, been very, sort of open with people about my, my allyship, you know, and talking a lot about my gay friends and the conferences I went to and everything, but then just sort of loved the people well in the church. Mm. Um, I, I found that there was one church I was a part of for 16 years. And that's kind of what I did where I just, you know, like, what'd you do on the weekend, Misty? Oh, you know, like a bunch of friends went out, you know, when we did this, we did all my gay friends, you know, and you know, people I, I learned, I met from this conference or whatever, and I would just talk very freely about it, but then just like, when it comes to, you know, loving the people in the church, you know, like you serve and you teach their kids in Sunday school and you bring the, the casserole and you, you know, you just, you just live, you live godly before them, you know? Yeah. And I think that that does a lot to change people's hearts and minds. You know, I, I don't think I used to teach Bible study in Sunday school and women's group a lot at my old church. I never once taught on this. Yeah. Um, except one, one time my pastor asked me to, he forced me to, <laughs> but, um, I never once taught on it. And like, after about 10 years, pretty soon, almost all the women in the group were sort of on the same page as me when it came to these things, you know? Yeah. So if we're talking about like changing hearts and minds, I, I do recommend the, the 10 year plan. Um, but if your church is a little bit more, um, you know, advanced than that, I would say, you know, relationships. I mean, just like just spending time with, with, you know, gay Christians. I mean, all, all my closest friends are gay. Yeah. Um, it's kind of weird for me to talk about make friends with people who are gay. Like, like to me, it's just, of course, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just like, I wouldn't have friends if I didn't do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I, I just think that, you know, there's nothing can replace just, you know, really getting to know somebody and serving next to them and, and praying with them and, and walking with people and just committing yeah. to being like, you know, I'm going to walk with you to the grave, you know, we're in this t- all the way to the end. Um, there's just nothing that, that replaces like, you know, if, and then you see like, this is why the church needs to get over this because just the beautiful souls, you know, just the, the beautiful the beautiful things that you miss out on when you're not friends with, with people, you know, who are, right. you know, who, who have been through just, you know, the ringer and have come out like gold. I mean, just, I cannot say enough about, you know, my, my friends, you know, who are, who are gay and, and who are Christians. So. Got a good group. Next one is from a gay pastor um, in a mixed orientation marriage says someone I really love and respect in my congregation recently told me they were praying for my attractions to change so that I could be straight. How would you respond to, um, to a congregant who would make a statement like that? 
I, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, with that's strange. And with, with all the talk about, you know, exalting marriage to the point where we're excluding single people from our churches when mm -hmm. it comes to a mixed orientation marriage, all sudden marriage is not so important. Um, I just find that, um, I guess I would just probably give the standard answer about, well, you know, I'm committed to my marriage. It's my vows and my love. And <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I, I, I don't know what to say to that person. Yeah. But I mean, in my heart, I would just be asking like, hmm, you know, like, I don't know, like why, why is it that marriage is always such the priority when it's, when it kind of fits in line with an anti-gay, you know, rhetoric, but then like when it comes to this, all of a sudden marriage is not important, you know, your commitment's not important. Yeah. I think um, this is a conversation I've had with gosh, students over the years with my mom <laughs> of them wishing that either we could become straight or that God was okay with gay relationships out of concern for us of like, life would be easier if you were straight, you wouldn't have like, why does God require you to struggle this much? Um, really more out of just a sadness of thinking that our lives are so much harder and that it would just be easier if God would make us straight. Um, do you have any, have you heard people kind of make comments like that or like a, res, a good response to people who say things like that? Like they're sad for us because they know our lives. They think, they think our lives are so much harder because, because we're gay and we're Christians. I mean, I guess, you know, it's hard because people don't understand. It's hard because people don't walk with you. It's hard because people um, don't listen, um, don't include and don't appreciate, you know, your contribution. Um, let's work on, on that. Um, I think that would make things so much easier. And then I think that the fruit of, of the struggle would be would, um, would really abound in the body of Christ, you know, like, um, there's something about the depth, the spiritual depth of a person who has, you know, grappled with, you know, um, with darkness of the soul and with, you know, asking God why, and, and like, what is, what is my purpose and, and where do I fit in, you know, on the margins, there's something about those people who are on the margins who, who really have something to bring into the center, you know, and, instead of just feeling, you know, oh, I wish you would be straight, which, you know, is not going to happen. Let's, let's do something about what can happen, you know, which is to understand and to include and to, to really like, you know, build, build, build you up in your gifts and give you a place to serve and give you a place to belong and to contribute. Yeah. I had a, a student that, that made a similar statement one time that she was just so sad that I would never have that one person to love me forever and why God couldn't just be okay with how I was or couldn't make me straight. Um, and like trying to really gently say, thank you so much for caring about me um, in that way and for loving me and being concerned um, about this, this life that God has given me but trying to just assure those people that, that God is very real in my life in the situation that I find myself and that, that my hard and difficult thing is just different from whatever their hard and difficult thing is. It's not necessarily better or worse. It, it's just, this, this is the thing that God has given me to to walk through life with, and that my life isn't less fulfilling. I'm not less loved. I don't have less intimacy. Um, I don't have a greater struggle than other people necessarily. And it ended up being a really good conversation um, with this student because she realized how many preconceived notions she had about love and about intimacy and about relationships um, because she had this really like Disney princess kind of idea of love and marriage and sex and, and everything and, and realizing that 
just because you don't find the one true love, it doesn't mean that you're missing out on the great, you know, the most fulfilled life that God has for you. Um, I mean, if that's the case, then, you know, Jesus was single. So Jesus himself had some sort of lesser human experience um, because he wasn't married or didn't have that one. So it ended up being a really good conversation. Um, So I think trying to remember that um, is a big part of it. Um, Here's one. What do I tell my straight, older, single Christian college professor who's lovely and caring has this super startling blind spot around gay people. (laughs) She sent me a video because we've talked about sex and its purpose and marriage, but then sent the recent video with um, Rosaria Butterfield and Christopher Yuan and Beckett Cook. I know a lot of people have, have seen that video, but apparently was sent to them as a, here's a great thing for you to be a a good resource. Um, And it has been really emotionally damaging to a lot of people. How do you, how do you respond or how, how is a good way for us to respond when people who mean well send resources or send suggest people that within the side B community have been fairly damaging, um, incendiary condescending in a lot of, uh, of times, um, how do you explain the side B position and why those types of teachings can be hurtful and even harmful um, to our community without seeming disrespectful or like doing it in, with the love that we would like other people to show us? How, how do we deal with the side X kind of help people want to give? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I read Christopher Yuan's book and, and Rosario Butterfield's testimony I've heard numerous times. They, they're kind of coming from slightly different perspectives, you know, and um, it's, it's hard because, you know, they are, they are people who are saying things that, you know, a lot of the straight church wants to hear, you know. Um, and meanwhile, you know, side B, I think, is saying something that's a little bit more challenging, you know. Yeah. And so... Um, yeah, it's, it's hard because, I mean, <laughs> sometimes with a straight audience, you know, they're not too good on nuances um, and, and it can be, it can be difficult to wade in there and try to like explain, you know, side X, side Y, side B, yeah. you know, all these kind right. of things, which I find <laughs> even can chart. Myself, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not sure how helpful that is, you know, and, and one thing I've realized recently too, is that sometimes you when it comes to these um, struggles and, you know, over arguments or debates or conflict conflicts, sometimes you can get drawn into someone else's agenda real easily and let them set the agenda. Yeah. In- instead of like, and then that's kind of how you end up waltzing down this path where it's like, now you're not even talking about anything relevant, you know? <laughs> um, sometimes I, 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 I try to be more careful about like not getting sucked into somebody else setting the agenda yeah. Like, you know, what words I'm supposed to know how to define and what, how I'm supposed to justify my existence in this particular way. And you have to kind of like testify of Christ in, in a different way. You know, like if Christ is working in your life, if he's giving you the grace to, to live as he is calling you to do, you know, testify of that. Right. Um, there's something about like the video that goes around that seems very intimidating, like, oh, everybody is buying into that right now. And now they're just frozen into that, like, you know, into that view, but not necessarily Um, your testimony and your witness and, you know, being what Christ is calling you to be and and walking the way he's called you to walk is more lasting and more, more powerful than just some video. So I don't know. I mean, I guess, I, I mean, it's up to you whether you want to respond directly or, or, you know, just simply pull back and talk about where Christ is leading you in your life. But sometimes you have to be careful about getting sucked into what, what other people's boxes are that they set up for you. You have to answer to this. Otherwise, you'll be wrong. And then, therefore, you'll be dismissed, you know? Yeah, that um, you don't necessarily have to answer every question that's asked was 
probably one of the greatest pieces of advice that I've ever received from anyone. Um, Jesus just didn't. Because, <laughs> yeah, just because it's asked, it doesn't mean you have to answer it. And sometimes you can respond to a question with another question. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. And sometimes you just have to let other people have the last word, which is probably one of the hardest things for me. Um, but there's a lot of wisdom in that. Um, Misty, thank you so much for spending this evening with us um, and for just being such a, a constant and, um, and loving advocate. I've so appreciated getting to know you uh, better the last couple of years and um, I'm always encouraged by, by your grace and humility and, and just wisdom. Um, but great courage as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, if anybody has any further questions that you would love to ask, and we just haven't had time to address those tonight, feel free to shoot us an email at Revoice. You can use the info at revoice.us uh, email address, and we'll be happy to send relevant questions on to Misty. We may even do a follow-up recorded video that we might post somewhere if you've got some good things for us to follow up with. Um, but thank you so much for everyone that has signed in, um, that you joined us tonight. And this will be available on the YouTube channel through the end of March. And then it will be moving over to the Digital Resource Library where you can find every deep dive and every conference dating back to the very beginning in 2018 um, are all there um, on the digital resource library. So Misty, thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in and we will do this again soon. Thanks for having me.